Welcome to episode 306 of the DFO Rundown, brought to you by Bet365, our sports betting partner, just in time for the 2024 playoffs. We'll be here with Bet365 to provide you all the news, analysis, lines, and betting options for the playoffs until one team is left standing. We are down to four, and it should be a great conference finals. Have fun at Bet365 and use the code DAILY365. I'm Jason Greger. Welcome in uh, Frank Saravalli, who is uh, back home in uh, in Philadelphia, reacquainting himself with his dog and family and kids. So that's always nice. Frankie, how you doing? Uh, yeah, better now. Uh, it had been a long odyssey through the first two rounds in the Western Conference. Being someone based on the Eastern Seaboard, I never poked fun at the idea of the increased travel in the West because I know it's a real thing, but when you do it and live it, it's a different thing. So I could understand any player that plays in the West that says, or especially one that got a taste of the East to start and then says, Hey, I'd like to stay in the East. Yeah, I could. Uh, and it's understandable, especially, you know, some of those central, like you were going to Vancouver to Nashville, which is, you know, uh, you, you're probably even more in agreements with me, Frank, why it's ridiculous. The uh, four on four, no crossover. I think Frank would agree now. No reason. Yeah, it's and Nashville too is right on the border of the Eastern Time Zone, so yeah. it's it's pretty far east, and it's uh it's a slog. Vancouver, Nashville, Vancouver, Edmonton was way easier, but still a solid twenty five hundred miles from home. So now let's uh some we'll get to the playoffs in a second, but uh, some other news to discuss that we haven't talked about. Um, yesterday, both the Kings and the Devils announced a. Uh, Coaches, uh, the Kings remove the interim tank from Jim Hiller, and uh, Sheldon Keefe is the new bench boss in uh, New Jersey. Let's start with the Devils and, and Sheldon Keefe, who, you know, his regular season, he had a 607 winning percentage, 212 wins, 97 losses, 40 overtime losses. Exceptional record. Uh, in the playoffs, 16 and 21, uh, they won one series. And I look at him, and we had talked about it like New Jersey is a pretty attractive place to coach. Um, he's a guy that, you know, is going to come in, and I think there's a good chance to have success. Um, I, I thought last year some people overrated the Devils at the start of the season and injuries and some inexperience on the blue line. But, you know, if they, if they get some consistent goaltending, they should at least be a team that's competitive for a playoff spot, almost guaranteed. Oh, I'll, I'll make you a guarantee right now. If they get league average goaltending, they are a guaranteed playoff team. That's the biggest thing that held that team back last year. It's not even close. It's the one thing that Tom Fitzgerald hasn't been able to solve in his four plus years as GM is to get NHL level goaltending on a consistent basis. And it's one that needs to be fixed this summer. Um, I think they've got a real shot to do so. And I think it's going to be really interesting for Sheldon Keefe. I'm curious to see what he looks like the second time around. I think any coach, that has the perspective of especially working for the Toronto Maple Leafs in that market leaves feeling like there were probably some things that they'd want to do differently or handle differently or approach in a different manner. And I think he, his regular season record speaks for itself. I don't hinge the Toronto Maple Leafs losses in the playoffs on him. If you don't get, top level scoring from your stars. If you can't score period, I don't care if it's Scotty Bowman, Toe Blake, Jack Adams, whoever it might be, you you can't win. And I think there's going to be a lot less pressure in New Jersey. There's not much media coverage. Um, they're kind of out of the limelight. They're not in the New York city spotlight. And it's not to say that there's not pressure to perform I guess my, we, and by the way, we talked about how attractive this job is. Like, I, I think with the young pieces that they have, plus their young back end, you could view it as a detriment, but they gained some significant experience last year and then add in another prime piece in Seamus Casey. I think that team has the potential to be really, really good. And I, you know, I think it's actually in some ways a way more attractive job. You, you know, you want to work for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You want to work for hockey's version of the the New York Yankees. That's going to work every day is like going to church. I, I get it. 
but roster contracts prospects i think it's just a way better chance of success in new jersey outside of the spotlight than it is in toronto and i think my only real question would be given that he was only fired earlier this month has he really gained the proper perspective necessary to answer some of those questions that we're talking about Possible. I just want to point out the Leafs aren't the Yankees because the Yankees won a lot. But anyway, um, we, be, uh, yeah, I won. guess the proper co comparison would be the Montreal Canadiens. 27 yeah. World Series, 24 Stanley Cups. Yeah. Although that, uh, you know, that the Habs in, in the uh, post expansion a little bit different, but at least they've won. They had a great 70s. Um, and you even can't they, even compare the Habs and the, no. and the Leafs. No. Post expansion. No, no can't. Um, I, I think, yeah, I do wonder about, you know, taking a break. Some coaches, you know, I, I've talked to a few and I found coaches who, you know, had been, you know, three, four teams, been coaching for 15, 20 years. Some of them needed more of a break. Whereas, you know, a younger guy like Sheldon Keefe is, you know what, you're you're itching. You're obviously disappointed how the season ended. I, I think we could tell during the year there was some frustration. But, you know what, job comes along in New Jersey's a different situation because in a lot of cases, not as much now because coaches are are fired like got people throw out the garbage on it's unreal how quickly coaches get changed now. But usually you don't like you're it's tough to get a good job, you know, like no offense to the San Jose Sharks, but that's not a coaching job that's really lined up for any sort of success. Right. New Jersey is. And I, and I think Winnipeg is as well. Seattle's mm, kind of a run lower, you know, kind of where they're going. They got some older guys they are probably in transition still. But, you know, that New Jersey job, I could see why he would take it because there's not a lot of jobs like they're a team that should be coming up the escalator. They're, they're not going down uh, and they're not even uh, where the escalator is broken. Like some of the bottom teams, right? Like some coaches go to a city, Frank, and we can tell, well, this guy's going to last two or three years and the team's probably not going to win, right? Like whoever takes a San Jose job, that's how it's going to be. Like the chance of that guy staying there until they're good is very, very low. Well, that's actually the perfect segue to Jim Hiller with the Los Angeles Kings, because look, I, I don't know Jim Hiller from a hole in the wall. I I've, I've never talked to him, never met him. Don't know much about his style or thought process and how he views the game. I find it fascinating to me that the LA Kings had a very mediocre run under Jim Hiller, I think is a fair way to describe it. And yet they never conducted a search. They just said, you know what? Nah, this is the guy. And I'm not saying he can't be. I'm just saying, how did you arrive at that conclusion without talking to anyone else first? Yeah, well, I'm guessing they had some internal talk. And, you know, Hiller, I, I've known, I've met Jim, talked to him quite a few times. Of course, he coached in the Western Hockey League uh, many years for, uh, for Chilliwack and, and Tri-Cities. And, you know, he's been an NHL assistant coach, I think, I think it's 14, 15. It might be, it might be 13, 14. I have to double check, right? Because he was with Detroit and he's been with Toronto and the Islanders and now with LA. So he's got lots of coaching experience. He was a head coach, not the so NHL. He's got level. 10 years of NHL assistant years, coaching okay. experience. He has one, two, three, four, five, six. He has eight years of WHL head coaching experience. Yeah. I, here, here's my point. We can all hockey DB him and look up his resume. Never at any point has Jim Hiller been atop anyone's head coaching list. Yeah, well, probably because I think when you're an assistant coach on different teams, those guys don't get mentioned, right? Like usually if you look at the That's well, BS. Guy... Well, how come it is that how come it is that top level assistant coaches, guys that really make a name for themselves, are always on the, the radar? Where well, did he... Where did well, Spencer Carberry come from? Where well, didn't, did... Didn't he come from the head coaching job in the American League? But before that, he was an assistant coach. Yeah, but eventually they become head coaches, right? So that's why this is a little different, I find. No, Spencer Carberry came directly from the Toronto Maple Leafs bench to the Washington Capitals, two years as an NHL assistant. Okay. So I, I, my point is, there's always assistant coaches that you're like, oh yeah, that guy's gonna be one of the next ones. Craig Berube, yeah. just hired by the Toronto Maple Leafs. He was a Flyers assistant for a long time before he got a crack 
at being an NHL head coach. My point is he's never been a hot candidate. He's never been on a list. He's never even been a finalist for another job. And so you have him come in and, and again, he may be very impressive to work with. I don't know. My only point is I'd want to go through an exercise. And at the very least, I'd want to bring in five to seven candidates and I would want to pick their brain and steal yeah. intel and intelligence. Why wouldn't you do that? What's the harm in doing that? And oh, if yeah, Jim Heather's no your guy the whole time, here's my point. He ain't going anywhere else. No one's going to run in and steal, pluck Jim Hiller from you right in the middle of all that. And if he's day-to-day -day with hurt feelings in the meantime, well, then he shouldn't be your guy to begin with. Why not do the exercise? Why not go the extra mile? Why not turn over every stone possible? If you're Rob Blake and Luke Robitaille to say, we're the Los Angeles Kings, we should be a contender in this league, and we are going to find the coach that's going to put us over the top. Uh, that's valid. Uh, I think, honestly, I thought when I listened to the player exit meetings, Frank, oh, the, sorry, exit interviews, not the player meeting. The, to me, I thought right there, I was like, I think there's a really good chance Hiller's back. Because basically the players outlined the fact that they didn't like the system. I think, honestly, they took... The system I, that he perpetuated. Yeah. This is, this is what's I, making my mind blow even more. But don't you think... I believe that was an organizational standpoint. They felt this is what we're going to do. We're not going to change midseason. I'm not saying it's right, but I think that the came players down players acknowledged the in the moment that they hated it. Yeah, I agree. So the players say they hate it. You fire the coach. It's the all-star break. You have 10 days before you play again with a bye week to figure it the frick out and install something new. This is hockey. It's not rocket science. These guys have been playing forever. To sit here and say, we're going to change our not going to change our structure because it's the mid season. That's that's lunacy. So they hate it. They stick to it. And then what all that signals to me is that you have a coach that's willing to be puppeted by management. Hmm, that's what it signals to me. Yeah, it's possible. I, I think honestly, even though he's the same coach, the fact that everything in LA is going to be different. And the big question is going to be, you talked about New Jersey, what do they need? Well, LA is in the exact same boat. Right, like I look at LA's last season, and you said you're like, "Oh, it's a real risk," and the risk was we're going to roll the dice with the, with no real star goaltender and see what happens, and then we saw what happens. Right. Okay. So let me ask you this: Where did the Los Angeles Kings finish this season in save percentage in the NHL? I don't know, sixteenth, fourth. Really? Yeah, but they don't give up a lot. I, yeah. I just slapped myself. I don't know if the microphone picked yeah. that up. What? They finished fourth in the league in save percentage. Goaltending's not their problem. Cam Talbot like was system. not the reason sure. they lost in the first round to the Edmonton Oilers. It's because they couldn't score a power play goal and they couldn't keep a shorthanded goal out of their net. Fourth in the league in save percentage. Their team save percentage last year was 909. Do you know what league average was? 898. It's not goaltending. And it's, if you're going to say it's because they don't give up a lot, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, that's not what's keeping the LA Kings from, from advancing and progressing. And in some ways, you could argue that because of that, they should have stuck with their structure. Well, no, no chance you stick with that. You don't, it doesn't win. You're sitting it back. It changed midstream. Yeah. Oh, I, well, we can, I, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. So I don't have a problem if they, if they didn't do it. Um, and I agree with you. And I've said this all along. The best advantage you can have when you have an, an opening is to find out from people outside your organization, how they view your organization. And so to me, the bigger, the bigger question here is the, the, the bigger question here is the uh, uh, like Rob Blake and what's his direction. Right. As far as where they're going, um, you know, him and Luke Robitaille and the direction from a top in L.A. Is it the right direction? He, here's my point, Jay. I'm not saying that Jim Hiller can't be successful. And I'm not slagging Jim Hiller or his his resume at all. My point is it's purely organizational philosophy. What are you doing to to improve your team? And why are you not trying to turn over other stones? It just feels like they're leaving 
a lot on the table by not at least going through the exercise. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. It's surprising that they didn't use the advantage of, as you said, even if you, you could lie to everybody and say the job's open just to get some intel from the other coaching candidates. But when you, when you enter your end of season press conference and start dropping little nuggets along the way. Oh, Jim Hiller, brilliant hockey mind. Yeah. Like I All thought these Jim different Hiller. things that they started to say, you're like, okay, we, we know that that's the case that he's going to be the guy. That's fine. But I'd, I I want to find out, I would want candidates to pick apart my team and pick apart how they'd play against us. And I'd also want to know how you can be successful. Yeah, I, I will say, like, I know you use the save percentage, but um, I looked at, uh, like, saves above expected and everything like that that Kevin Woodley talked about, and, and L.A. wasn't nearly where they were in just okay. the uh, the front save percentage for them. And okay. I watched that series Here's the against... bottom line. Here's the bottom line, Jace. Goals against, third out of 32 in the entire NHL. It's not goaltending. I don't care what anyone says. Man. You're not going to convince me otherwise. Okay. Camp, is, is Camp Talbot the reason why they lost in the first round to the Oilers? Well, I don't think he was the reason. They, uh, I don't think that uh, their goaltending really helped them in that series. Is he the reason they lost? No, they're just not as good as Edmonton, right? Their penalty kill is the reason they lost, Frank. And goaltender is supposed to be your best penalty killer. Their penalty killing was terrible. Well, that's they where were, they lost the series. They were overmatched. But but look, but look at the series though. Five on five, it was even. There were 12 goals, 12 for, 12 against. They got absolutely obliterated on special teams. Their power play sucked, both special teams. Their power play was terrible and their penalty kill couldn't stop couldn't stop anything. What did Edmonton scored? I think what 55%. Right? Like Edmonton's combined power uh, special 45%. teams 145 because they didn't give up a goal. Right. I'm right. saying special teams 45%, were yeah. Yeah. So, that's where I look at it. like um, do you think honestly that uh, Talbot's a guy that you could go deep with in the playoffs? I think you need to do it in tandem. I think the the days of a of one goalie taking you all the way through till the end are they're nearing extinction. Okay, well that's really good. That's a great segue because we have teams. Three of the four teams in the conference final. Bobrovsky, who many people remember, many people were saying one of the worst contracts ever. Yeah. And Bob wasn't playing great early, but he's been really good lately. He was exceptional last night in Game One for the uh, for the Panthers. You got Shesterkin, who, and I know Jonathan Quick played a little bit this year, but Shesterkin's their guy. Um, I think if you have a good enough goalie, you can do it. The problem is there's not enough of those guys who are consistent every year, so I think that part's valid. But I still think if you have an elite goalie. You can ride him no problem. 55, 58 starts, and then he's your guy every night in the playoffs. Three of the four teams remaining have an elite goalie. Sergei Bobrovsky is a multiple Vezina Trophy winner. Is I think. Yeah, is Jake now? Well, let's. Is he is, or does he have one? Um, I think he has two. Like, he has two Vezina trophies, 2013 yeah. and 2017. So yeah. Jake Ottinger burst onto the scene and his numbers would suggest that he's an elite level goalie. Yeah, Ottinger's, oh, yeah, hey, Ottinger's pretty good. Durkin, no you're not going to debate me that he's an elite oh, level God, goalie. Oh, God, no, it's just Durkin is elite. That's so what I'm saying. the clear outlier here is the Oilers. Yeah. Stuart Skinner is not an elite level goalie. And the real indictment of the Vancouver Canucks in round two was that they never asked the question again once Stuart Skinner went back in, hey, are you any good? Yeah. Yeah, no, they didn't test him. Well, that's when you sit back and don't... Although I'll give Edmonton credit. They've Edmonton through two rounds has uh, allowed the fewest high danger chances. They have the lowest expected goals. They're, it's funny. Everybody still thinks the orders because they got the four leading scorers in the NHL playoffs that so they're all offense, but defensively as a system, as long as they don't throw their own grenade, which they're still very good at, they can throw a grenade in their own zone at a key time, unlike any team, but overall they're pretty good, but let's get to game one last night. The, uh, the Panthers and the Rangers and Bobrovsky was good. He wasn't tested a ton, but when he was, obviously he was, uh, he was exceptional. Um, you know what? We, we've talked a lot about the Rangers power play. And, you know, I, I thought if the Rangers are going to win, their power play is going to have to be great like it was against Carolina. And for one game, it wasn't. I was just curious, though. Where do you think Jake Ottinger ranks in save percentage since he entered the league? 
Um, well, he's what well, I think his save percentage is like nine ten or nine eleven. His career so is nine thirteen in one hundred and ninety three games played, and he ranks tied for seventh. So it's Omar, Shesterkin, Sorokin, Hellebuck, Saros, Vasilevsky, and Ottinger and Demko are tied. Yeah, I'd say that counts as elite level goaltending. Yeah, he wasn't great this year, but he's he, uh, he's, he's also hurt definitely. for most of the year, yeah. or a good chunk of the year. Yeah, like his series against Calgary was still probably the greatest he's played. Like that was unreal. And but so. he then he came back last year and finished fifth in Vezina. Yeah. Oh no, he's fine. I have no issues with Ottinger. Like, although they're saying he's a little under the weather, so I'll be curious about that tonight. But um, do you make the Rangers five on five? Can they compete with Florida? Or is this really if their power play can't carry them, they can't win? Oh, I think you'd be careful writing off the Rangers, regardless of how the game's played, shorthanded or five on five. Even though they didn't generate much. They had 13 shots on goal, if I'm not mistaken, through two periods. It was still a one nothing game in the third. Yeah. Um, that I think that's going to be the worst game you get out of the Rangers. I I still pick the Cats heading into the series, but I'd, I'd have a hard time believing that you're going to see. I think Peter Laviolette said it so well after the game that he said that was that just didn't look like us. So full marks to the the Panthers cuz they can create that havoc and and have the ability to play that way, but I'd be real surprised if we saw another game quite like that from New York. Yeah, well, the thing about the Cats were if you if you listen to their players afterwards, they didn't like their game at all, right? Like Matthew Kachuk, how many times in his post-game press conference they say, "Ah, oh, we got a lot of things we didn't do very well tonight. We're happy with the win, but we got to be better. So, you know, it looked sloppy's the wrong word, but that game didn't look as crisp as I think the rest of the games in the series are going to look. Disjointed is how I would describe it. That's fair. Yeah. Like it was a little bit of ping pong at times. Yeah. Like nothing happened. And just like, like in the second period specifically, there was a stretch where like an MSG is really loud. Like the fans were just kind of waiting to have anything to cheer for. And there was nothing like there, there was one. I can't remember who it was. Cooley. He, he went to hit one of the Panther players, the Ranger, he fell down and the crowd still cheered. Cause they're like, Oh, I think it's going to be a hit. Like they were just, they were itching to want to cheer yeah. for anything. And there was just nothing happening in the second period. They were fired up. And that's the disappointing part. You have a fan base that's engaged. The gardens rocking and you give them nothing to cheer about. I saw a lot of people wondering um, because he's an emotional guy, like that uh, they're going to look to put uh, Rempe back in. I'm not, I don't, not sure I really buy that one guy. Now I get when you have one big guy like that, maybe everybody else feels an inch taller or such, but you know, you're in the conference finals. You're a team that was in the conference finals two years ago. I, I don't know if it's going to make that much of a difference. Where do you come out on that? I would put him back in. I think there's something to the idea of the emotional lift and boost with this team. I understand his limitations, but I the tough part is who do you take out? Right, exactly. Because like the the one guy who brings him a physical element, because I do think you need some physical players against Florida, Cooley, but he only played seven minutes, right? Like he played the fewest minutes out of their forwards. But if you take him on, you put him Rempy. I'm not, I'm not sure that's really helping you at all. So yeah, and I don't. Get the sense that they want to take out Jimmy VC. No, like you're, you're not you're not taking out Heedle. So uh, uh, that's that's really that's what you run into. It's kind of the same debate that we had the other day about Corey Perry and what happens with his lineup slot with the Oilers, right? Yeah, that yeah, shows you, you know, like little different players, of course. But uh, yeah, I see your point. Like it, it'll be interesting for the Rams. I I don't think they're a team that panics. It's one game. Um, Although I'd like to to find the stats, like I know that you know winning game one isn't uh, you know the do all end all. We've seen like Dallas hasn't won game one yet in this playoffs. Uh, the orders have well, the orders are two and nine in the McDavid era in, in game ones, uh, including one and eight. And uh, you know they're in the conference final for the second time in three years. They found ways to come back, but I'd love to know what that record is in the conference final. Right, like I think when you get to the better teams. 
I wonder if it increases more than it does throughout the the early rounds. So I might have to get my NHL stats buddies on that because I'd be curious what the record is for and it's one and zero in the conference finals. I got to think that it means a little bit more then. I could be wrong. It's just a gut feel, but so we'll see. I look at the uh, the Panthers though when you watch that game last night, Frank and Kachuk was saying all the things he didn't like about his team, but and I just I don't see a lot of holes in Florida, right? Like when I look at at the Rangers and I'm like, yeah, they'll be competitive. I don't see like what's the area they can break down. It's a good question. I I, I don't know the answer. Can they have? Yeah, has, like, has anyone asked that question yet? Yeah, like I I picked the cats too in six, and I just I, I like their combination. They've got the skill to match the Rangers. Um, I I think they have more tenacity and truculence if you want to use that word amongst their skilled forwards right like having no offense but having guys on your fourth line who can bang and crash is nice but when you got guys who are in your top line and your second line and they got bennett on one line like they you know they ever when he got hurt they put lundell on that second line and put him on the third line now they kind of spread it across the board and you know i think that matters and you know and then you got reinhardt and barkov on your top line who might be the best defensive winger center combo in the nhl not to mention pretty good offensively Mm -hmm. i mean i think that's a totally fair way to present it and look at it i mean i think there's really not and this is is actually why i picked the panthers to win the series there's really not an apparent hole like no They've got depth. They've got physicality. They've got speed. They've got, I mean, they got contributions from their back end last night, getting a goal from, well, I guess it was taken away, but Ekman Larson, like they've found ways to get different contributions from different people. And they've got a clutch factor to them. Like Carter Verhage has this Ooh. clutch gene to him that not everyone's born with. <laughs> no. He is uh man, what a what a player that guy's become. Woo. Fun to watch. Like him a lot. Um, let's let's move, Frank, out uh to the west. And you have Dallas and Edmonton. Um, Rupe hints skating good, game time decision, same like, and I think that's huge for, for Dallas if they get oh my god. He's, right. Um, and if he doesn't play game one, he's gonna be in the series. It's like Adam Henrique for Edmonton, who I think is going to be a big addition and maybe can inject some life into the third line. But, you know, if Rupe Hintz is out and you're the Edmonton Orders, I just think game one becomes even more crucial for them because once he comes back, it's clearly going to get harder. So, you know what, to try to take advantage of it uh, when, when a team's a little bit weaker. You know, not that you know, it's, it's not that they don't have depth. they got a lot of depth. But, you know, the, the guys they replace him with aren't as good as Rupe Hintz. So, um, I, that to me is a storyline to watch Hawk and paw. They're going to start with five D men, uh, and basically play five until he gets back. And it sounds like he could be ready later in the series. So, you know, um, now as you look and we're closer and, and hence, here, uh, my guess is whenever Henrik comes back, hints is back. Not to, to say that they're linked, but I think both those guys are probably quote early in the series. Yeah. Chris yeah, Knobloch like- said before game three for Henry game three or before is the term he used. Yes. Hints has been skating aggressively on his own. will rejoin the team at some point and then back in the lineup. So oh. I'd say the proper terminology for both those players is day to day. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Like Henrik, the big news for him was he's been on the ice with the orders for probably the last five days. Granted, they don't practice a lot. But then the minute they went to line rushes, he just sat on the bench. And usually guys will rotate in or you'll go. He didn't do it. But he did. I wa- I, w- I watched very intently uh, before they flew to Dallas with him. And he went through everything and he was put through the paces. And, you know, he looked like a guy who's really close. Now, maybe they need one more. Right. And it's an ankle injury. Um, you know, I, I can't confirm 100% of it's, it's a high a, ankle sprain. I can, but, I can confirm yeah. 100% it's a high yeah. ankle sprain. So I know that. Uh, and you can't. You know, he played in game two, and then obviously, whether he re-aggravated or wasn't good enough, he only played 11 minutes that game. You know, and he didn't look, he didn't look great. So, I, I, you know, I understand why. Like, I think Henrique is under 
appreciated by some people and how good he is and what he adds to Edmonton. Like this guy scored 24 goals this year. He scored 20 goals seven times in his career. He's a really smart player. He's good around the net. He wins face-offs. And I know people are like, oh, he isn't fast. I'm like, who cares? Not everybody has to be fast to be successful in the NHL. But Adam Henri- Henrique is ultra smart. And, and I think he's a big loss to their team because he's a guy, whether you play him with McDavid or you play him down the lineup, He's going to add some scoring chances for your team. And he's really good defensively. He's yep. really smart defensively. So, you know, when he comes back, he's got an ankle injury. I would expect he would start on the left wing and you have McLeod at center and Fogel on the right side and you can move Derek Ryan down. Um, but that's where I see him. And then I wonder if he gets up to speed that maybe you move McLeod to the wing because there was a stretch here the season when he was on the wing where he was just better, right? Um, like I know McLeod made the ultimate gaffe in game seven. Everybody saw it, it was terrible. Um, his defensive game has been decent, but in the offensive zone, Frank, like you talked about Corey Perry earlier, if they're going to reinsert Corey Perry in the lineup, they're best to play him on the fourth line with Carrick and Yanmark because those guys can cycle the puck. McLeod and Fogel don't cycle the puck, and that's Corey Perry's game. He doesn't. You're not, not taking a guy out off Derek the Ryan, though. Pardon? You'd have to take out Derek yeah. Ryan then. Well, I know I, that's what I'm saying. It's not ideal. They're not going to so do I, it. Yeah. So, and but I guess you could even move Derek Ryan can cycle a little bit better. You could even play him in the middle. With the, Jan Mark can cycle the puck very well. Jan Mark was awesome in Game Seven. Oh, he's I just very don't good see them making big changes. I think they stick with what what won in Game Seven. Henrik coming back is a different story, but yes. by then you might either a have another injury or b have enough evidence of someone that the moment is a little bit too big for, and you're gonna you might have some interesting decisions to make depending on how McLeod plays. Yeah, I, I don't see Perry coming in. Uh, definitely for game one and maybe not until later in the series, depending on how it goes. If, if all of a sudden they feel like they're, they're losing the battle in the trenches, but the difference is Dallas's defense is way more mobile than Vancouver's defense, but they're not as big and as heavy as Vancouver's defense. And so like, I look at a guy like Evander Kane went toe to toe was the door off in that series. And it was a great battle. Right. And luckily Edmonton had him. It's probably not talked about as much because Zadorov would have ran their show without him there. He's the one guy who could at least stand up to him. Dallas defense doesn't play that way. They're very good, but they're not overly physical. They don't take penalties. Frank, I was looking like they've averaged two penalties a game in the playoffs Two. Now their penalty kills terrible at 69%, but they're, you're only giving up two chances uh, a game. So, you know, maybe you get a power play goal on average. A game is kind of how it works. Maybe. So um, I, uh, I look at Edmonton and I'm curious to see how they can attack uh, Dallas's defense. Cause Watching the Colorado games, they weren't overly physical. And I wonder if – now, Edmonton's not a chip-and-chase team either, but they do have some guys, and I wonder if they try to wear down Dallas's defense a little bit more than Colorado did. Well, you did you mention the ice time factor? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I outlined that about Heiskanen. Has so far in the playoffs, at uh, at 5-on-5, five five, he's played 311 minutes. Um, Evan Bouchard, who's played the most minutes on Edmonton, has played 224. He would rank sixth amongst the Dallas D men. Now they played an over to double overtime game. Sure. But it's still, you know, that's only an extra. I added it. He averaged 27 minutes a game. He had played 38 that. So an extra 12 minutes isn't changing it. They rely heavily on their five. And if I'm Edmonton, I got to try to wear them down. hundred percent. It's that's going to be a big thing. But the problem is Edmonton has just been a, is it fair to say average team for checking? Yeah, they don't. They don't really dump and chase, right? Like they like to be a possession team. So when you possess the puck, you're not really hitting. Yeah, right. But even when there's been opportunities to do so, the it's not like they were punishing Vancouver's defense. No, well, no, well, Vancouver big heavy D. That's what I said. Outside of Kane and you know, Fogel, should, I'd like to see their, more. Their play McLeod. should have been to just hammer Quinn Hughes. Well, McLeod, I don't know how many times with his speed, Quinn Hughes makes a play. McLeod's right there and just turns away and doesn't finish his check. It's right by the flyby. Yeah. 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 That's why I mentioned McLeod because I think he's legitimately in danger at some point of coming out of the lineup if they have to make a decision. Yeah. Well, Chris Knobloch, the one thing that his parent, his parents, his players respect for him is that he gives them a chance to bounce back after a bad game or a bad play. And so I think he'll do that to McLeod, but I agree with you, Frank, he's a, he's on a short leash. Um, the other matchup, though, is interesting to me is, is Stan Colvin has been playing with Ben and Wyatt Johnson. And Wyatt Johnson obviously leads them in uh, in points for forwards with seven goals and four assists. And, you know, he's had a great playoffs. Um, 
they I looked at the Nathan McKinnon matchup, Frank, and they there was nobody who had a real significant like Lundell played the most minutes, 75 of 131, which is about 57 percent. Chris Tana was at 52% against him. Um, the highest forward was Wyatt Johnson, and he played 33 34% of McKinnon's minutes. Like they don't really, Pete DeBoer wasn't chasing any one line, or it would like to be uh, Lindell and, and Tanev, of course, the most. But even then, with 5D, you know, you can't do it. So I wonder if, if Knobloch tries to double shift McDavid here a little bit more just to see you know, what they're going to do on Dallas. Could be a fun cat and mouse game. Hmm. So you said Stankoven was with who? Stankoven's with Wyatt Johnson and Jamie Benn the last few games. And that's the, like, well, that's but the part of that's that thrown more. off just because of Rupe Hintz. I agree, but Hintz isn't going to be here in game one. So do they, I'm assuming they keep them together to start. But even Hintz, one, you know, one of the things Frank, that they've also shown has been Robertson, Johnson, and Stankoven. Yeah, so, they've switched them a bit, but the last two games, um, um, when Hints went out, it was Ben Stankoven and Johnson, right? And I wonder if that's what they'll uh, that's what they'll stick with at least to start, right? Maybe so, because it like two young kids who are really good players, but th that's a lot to ask two young guys if they're going to face up against uh, um, Connor McDavid, hmm. right? Because then they got Duchesne's with Pavelski and Marchment, and um, actually Robertson yesterday skated with Johnson and Stankoven, so. You know, they got lots of combos, but the Rupe hints effect, Daryl Ray was telling us how it, it it's not just like one line. It's basically changed all of their lines, right? Like Sagan was being excellent, but he's playing the wing. But now with, uh, with Rupe hints out, they move Sagan back to the middle and, you know, Daryl sees the team way more than I do. And he just says that, you know, they're not the same, right? Like Sagan's been way how better could on they the be? wing. Yeah. I mean, but, but even Sagan, Hintz right? Like is, now. Hints is elite. Hints oh, is not. He got Selkie love for me this year. Yeah. No, he's a good player. And he, you know what he reminds me of? Plays different position. But he reminds me of Adrian Kempe. Big guy who can absolutely fly, right? And he's dangerous all over the ice. Like, he's just a center, so he's a little bit more valuable. But that's who he reminds me of. Him and Kempe, their styles of play, watch them. They're both big, and they could both fly. And I think they're probably both underrated league-wide. Hmm. So, I asked you on Sunday when we were sitting in Tyler's basement... Yeah, 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 dude. Why would I change? It makes no sense. Okay, I, I'm, like I'm, I'm not I'm changing. I'm just, so no. how how many games and who's your pick? Uh, well, I picked Edmonton to start, so I'll pick Edmonton again. And uh, I have Edmonton in Florida now in the uh, Stanley Cup final. So you've changed because your team in the East got knocked out. Yeah, well, Carolina. Well, will you want me to pick someone else? No, I'm just laughing. Usually, yeah. you just you get a big X and you're done. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have Dallas in six. Yeah. And I, I, I think all that said, this whole notion of the Oilers are going to get run out of the building is, in, is, is also lunacy. Well, I got a stat for you. If, they, get, if they keep getting goaltending like Stuart Skinner provided to start last series, yeah. they will get run out of the building. And it will be short. Oh, yes. But if... If they it needs find to be average, just average, they're going to be just fine. So here's a stat for you, Frank, because you know me, I love researching stats. So the orders right now have Except the top four Kings goaltending, the scores in the uh, NHL. Well, you can give me, you can give me save percentage all you want. I don't care. I'm not I, trying. I'm just telling you when a team finishes yeah. third in the league and goal to, goals against the goaltending, yeah. isn't the issue. That's all. Yeah. Both, well, but we're, we're wearing blue shirts today. Both of our faces can turn blue. That's how long we'll debate. Okay, but did, so if, but you say that at the same time, you're like, Stuart Skinner's got to be better. Where'd the orders finishing goals against? Where'd they finish? Where I don't, I'm Skinner not talking finish? about the regular season. I'm talking about the playoffs. And Stuart Skinner is the worst statistical goaltender in playoff history in the salary cap era. Period. Okay, but, end of story. Okay. Well, what were the, no, no, no. You were using the Kings regular. What was the Kings say percentage in the playoffs? You didn't mention it. So you can't, you can't use one for one and one for the other. What the hell are you talking about? Okay, so what was Cam Talbot's save percentage in the playoffs? Yeah, go look at the Kings' save percentage in the playoffs. Cam Talbot had an 861. Thank you. Stuart Skinner was in the sevens. Yeah. Hey, dude, I'm not, my point is, though, LA's goaltending is still not great enough. Anyway, um, here's the stat for you. So the orders currently have three guys, uh, first time ever, three players from one team have uh, 20 points through two rounds. Actually, only four times ever 
in the NHL through two rounds have, has there ever been three players on any team have 20 points? So they're riding their big guns. No, that's, Hockey, that's an NHL record. It's never happened before. Yeah. That's what I said. And, um, the uh, three from one team. Heck, Frank, there's only ever been three across the whole league three other times. So it's pretty rare. Oh, okay. But um, I, I Ryan, Nugent, Ryan Nugent Hopkins has 16 points. He's fourth. In the NHL, there's only been 17 teams who have ever had four skaters or more have 20 plus points in a playoff series. Right now, this basically goes back to when they expanded in 79 because they never used to play enough games in the opening rounds. Right. Like like Bobby Orr played 14 games to win the cup one year and had 20 points, but they only played 14 games. So you look at that. And of those 17 teams, 13 of them won the Stanley Cup. The other four lost in the cup. Your Flyers twice in 1980 and in 2010. My you also. Flyers. Yeah. Well, you're in Philly. I know you're Flyers guy. Nothing wrong with that. Pretty good team. Also, you had the. um the 2016 San Jose Sharks and the 1991 Minnesota North Stars, who actually had five guys with 20 points. The NHL so the record 2016 six. Sharks and the 1991 North Stars both made it to the final. Yeah. And the Flyers in uh, and the 2010 Flyers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but the point is if you get four guys with 20 points, you're pretty much historically guaranteed a spot in the Stanley Cup final. So if Nugent Hopkins gets four points in this series, you could argue that's the key for them to make it to the Stanley Cup. I'm not buying on that one. I know <laughs> historically that that's what it says, but yes, that also doesn't really mean anything in terms of what happens next. That's already been accomplished for the Oilers. Well, no, he doesn't have it up. yet. He doesn't have the 20 points yet. No, no, but what I'm yeah, but what I'm saying is that like. Theoretically, Nugent Hopkins could have four points and Leon Dreisaitl and McDavid could have zero. That doesn't doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. I'm, just, I'm showing you what history has shown history, us. History, yeah. There's always a right. good lesson to learn. So I think uh, I think this is going to be a much more entertaining series than uh, like Edmonton, L.A. wasn't like there was goals, but, you know, L.A. sat back. Vancouver obviously didn't try to generate offense. Like I'm curious to see how Edmonton adapts to a team. What Dallas does very well is the one thing, like you talk about Stuart Skinner, and Kevin Woodley gave us the scouting report. Skinner, one of his biggest weaknesses is goals off the rush that goes, or you're coming down the left side, you pass across to the guy on the right side. That's an area of weakness for him. Well, the Dallas Stars love producing offense off the rush. And that, to me, it's Edmonton, I don't think, is going to have a chance in the series if they can't limit Dallas scoring chances off the rush. Well, and the strong part about Dallas in round two against Colorado was that they cut down Colorado's chances off the rush in half. They were, mm -hmm. eight, they had eight per game in the regular season, and Dallas cut them down to 4.7 or 4.9 per game yeah. when it came to round two. Like, that's another thing Edmonton likes to do if they can is create off the rush. And they really haven't had much of that these playoffs. Yeah. Well, and the, the one thing that Edmonton has that Dallas hasn't faced is a second line center, like Leon dry And that's, that's what Edmonton's got to hope is they're like, you know what we can't. Cause that basically the McKinnon line came at you, Frank. And it's like, if we can hold that line off, then there wasn't really much else to be fearful of in Colorado. All I would say, if that happens and the Oilers have to break glass in case of emergency again, and put dry settle and McDavid back Doesn't together work. again, it'll be, that'll be the end of their season. They, sh I get. They don't. It. They don't have enough depth scoring to get past that. They they, wow. they don't. It, it's fact. Like they haven't gotten it these playoffs. There, well, the third been no line's been awful. Step up. But but Kane scoring, Dylan Holloway scoring, Henry comes back. Right. They they got some guys if they do it. It's, but to me, I all I'll say it is all the numbers, up to Dallas and their depth. Eight all twenty the, goal scorers. Like it's not close. Well, Edmonton had seven. Okay. Right. But Fogel right now doesn't have a goal. So that's the problem, right? That to me is like Edmonton, like I know your best guys have to be your best guys to win. And I think that's usually the case. But if Edmonton's third line doesn't have a pulse offensively this series, it's going to be really hard to win. Fogel and McLeod, Fogel has an empty net goal. Don't count. McLeod has no goals. Um, you know, Derek Ryan, Corey Perry, when they've been there, they haven't produced the, anything. The Oilers had five 20 goal scorers this year. That's not, that's not seven and it's not eight. 
Well, Adam Henrique's a 20 goal scorer, dude. He had 24 goals, 18 in Anaheim, and then he had six and 20 games in Edmonton. Okay, that's six. Where are the other two you're getting? Or where's the other one you're getting? Well, what did Nugent Hopkins and Bouchard have? 18? Or, or is that the game we're going to play now? We're going to start adding goals to them? Oh, well, okay. Take, okay, but take Dallas's top eight scores and take Edmonton's top eight scores and tell me how many goals they have. Edmonton's got way more. Well, that you're that that that's not that that wasn't what the exercise was but, but no but it is though i think depth gets people take oh well eight 20 goal scores is better than six if you're eight 20 don't score more than your six then it isn't better well it it's we're talking about depth we're not talking about the ceiling of the talent because i i i'll echo what i said all playoffs long which is and it was proven correct in game six and seven the Edmonton Oilers have a ceiling and a level that the Vancouver Canucks on their best day couldn't get to if Edmonton plays at that level. The Edmonton Oilers have a similar, very impressive high ceiling that the Dallas Stars cannot reach if their stars take the day. But that's not what we were talking about. We were talking about depth, which is contributions from different people outside of those two, which, again... Have, over multiple playoff runs now has been proven that Edmonton does not get enough. That's the sto- That was the story of these playoffs through five games against the Canucks. Where was the depth? It's Dreisaitl and McDavid never disappoint. Well, Mc- I, McDavid had one point through games three, four, and five. McDavid's I, I hurt, one. Yeah, I know, but and I'm just two, saying that was the bigger and point two, these are two of the best playoff performers ever. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Ever. I don't doubt that. But they, they don't disappoint. So, like, you could pick at the word if you want, but they do not disappoint when it comes to the playoffs. Their failures have been on other people. Oh, hey, defensively, the order is for sure. Up until this year. This year, I think Edmonton defensively as a group overall has been pretty good. Their goaltending obviously let them down in a few games. There's no question about it. And their third line hasn't been good. But all I'm saying is, like when you look at every, we talks about, well, Dallas has more depth, but more depth. All that means is what Edmonton is averaging almost a goal per game more in the playoffs. So depth is depth, but it's not better. It doesn't score more. That's all I'm saying. Like sometimes people confuse, well, they got more depth. Depth is like, well, when I don't have the best player, I got to deflect to something else to try to make me feel better. And Dallas does have depth. Sure. But they don't outscore Edmonton. Right, they're averaging Edmonton's at three point eight three goals a game in the playoffs. Dallas is at two point nine two. Right now, the other thing to look for in this series, though, is going to be the special teams. Can Edmonton find a way to make Dallas take penalties? Which is hard. That's going to be the key because their penalty kill, and it was in both series. It wasn't like they just had one bad game. It was bad against Vegas, and it was bad against Colorado. Right, it was seventy two percent in one and sixty eight percent in the other, and there's there's sixty nine percent overall or something, whatever the number is. But to me, that's the key for Edmonton is can they find a way to draw penalties in the series? Just for the record, um, the Dallas Stars twenty goal scorers added up to two eleven, and the Edmonton Oilers twenty goal scorers, and I'll include Adam Henrique, even though he scored them for another team, they add up to one ninety five. So it's six versus eight. Yes. Right. So then you add in Nugent Hopkins and you add in Bouchard, where's another 36 and they're ahead. So eight versus eight. Okay. Yeah. I just think depth gets overrated sometimes. It's a nice, I, I don't, I don't, I think when you get to the playoffs, it doesn't. You need over a span of 27 games or however many you play in the postseason, you need different people on different nights. You can't just be the same three guys. And oh yeah, no. Well, sure. You, but how much? Like Cody the Oilers CC. are are heavily dependent on one five man unit that plays together at even strength, and it plays together at power play strength. That is. Well, Dry Settle does. Dry Settle played two games in the playoffs with McDavid. That's it. The rest he plays in the LA Kings series. He played eight minutes five on five with McDavid, and he's the leading scorer in the playoffs. They played thirteen out of twenty minutes together in one period. Against no, that's what I'm saying. There was two games against Vancouver where they played together, and I think it was a mistake. But if you look at their numbers in the regular season, the orders were a better team when they were apart. And they mm-hmm. were apart for 70% of the time in the regular season, five on five. Mm-hmm. If Edmonton plays them together too often, Frank, I think they have no chance to win. 
All right. Well, we got to run. That uh, you got the Oilers in how many games? Seven. All right. I got the the, the Stars in six. It's going to so be we fascinating. Both, we both have the road team winning the series on the on the road. Hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. Have fun weekend, Frank. We'll talk to you Monday.